So it's good to see the folks that we've seen before and good to have new folks here. And here comes one more. So, and maybe some other people. Hi, Joanna. Hi. Um, maybe some other people will, will come in. Um, so perhaps, uh, Jean, would you like to lead us in a settling meditation? Sure. Um, and I just want to apologize if you were a little confused about the Zoom link. It, yeah. it, as I said earlier, it's a moving target. So, um, yeah. Um, so thank you for your persistence if you had to uh, try several. Um, it's never it's never clear <laughs> what's going on. Um, so, yeah, thank you. So um, let's settle in and you're welcome to leave your camera on or turn it off, whatever you feel comfortable with during the meditation. We like to encourage people to have their cameras on when we're having discussion and uh, other things just to create community, but uh, you do what you need to do to feel comfortable. I'll just ring the bell to signal the beginning of the meditation. So taking a moment to come into the body. Feeling the weight of the body sitting. Feeling the contact with whatever you're sitting on. Feeling the contact with the floor, the earth beneath you. And as best as possible, just resting in the felt sense of the body. Arriving. Arriving in this body, with this breath, in this moment. Noticing if there's any pull, any desire to fix or change, ignore whatever is present. And as best as possible, this opening to what is now. This is how it is now. Being available. Available to the pleasant, the unpleasant, the neither pleasant or unpleasant.
arriving available. And if you choose, perhaps reflecting on what it is that draws you to this practice. With what do you want to align your life? What is the ground on which you stand? Connecting to your deepest intentions. Perhaps love or compassion, justice, non-harming. Connecting to whatever arises in the heart-mind as you reflect on your deepest intentions. And allowing that to be the ground on which you rest as you approach this practice. As you discern what causes suffering and what leads to non-suffering, And seeing if you can even connect with the felt sense of being grounded in your most wholesome desires. How does it feel in the body to be aligned, to be available? And available to the practice available to curiosity. Available to self-compassion. So feeling the body grounded on the earth. And the heart grounded in your deepest intentions.
and resting back. Resting, available, aligned. Breathing in and breathing out. just like to invite everyone to just take a moment and to look at the other faces on the screen. If we were all in the same room together, I know we'd all kind of be looking around and making eye contact and checking to see who else was in the room. And I just like to take a moment to do that and to appreciate that each one of you could have done many other things tonight, but you've come here and, um, and to support one another in this practice. So it's lovely to see each one of you. I'd like to start with a poem and it's by Mary Oliver. I love that even the title I like. It's the poet compares human nature to the ocean from which we all came. The sea can do craziness. It can do smooth. It can lie down like silk breathing or toss havoc shoreward. It can give gifts or withhold all. It can rise, ebb, froth, like an incoming frenzy of fountains, or it can sweet talk entirely as I can too, and so no doubt can you and you. So I love that poem because it really appreciates the full array of human experience. And as we do this practice, I think we, we appreciate that, that whole spectrum of human experience, but that also says that there are tools, there are practices to help us in the midst of that. Even though we accept that we might be very calm one day and the next day it's frothy, but how do we help ourselves? So tonight I wanted to talk about, one way to think about it is the two wings of mindfulness, the wing of compassion and wisdom. And I see in the practice of self-compassion, both of these wings, both of compassion end of wisdom. And so I just want to uh, share a bit about that and also do practices in which we can kind of explore ways that we can support ourselves. So the first thing I just say is like compassion, what is that? So I think about compassion, there's many ways to think about it, but a way I think about it is it's that caring, it's that, that desire to uh, to be of assistance, maybe, um, in response to the suffering that is inherent in all human life. Many of us at different times in our life, or just because of the nature of how we were born into this world, can have more or less, but we all have it. And this is really the first noble truth. So compassion is that desire to care about the suffering. That is inherent in being human. 
And when we do self-compassion, we turn that care probably towards the most difficult human, <laughs> um, ourselves. And what that does is that it offers us the ability perhaps to open our heart just a bit more, hopefully to have a little bit more spaciousness and to be able to be present. So this evening, I wanted to talk about a specific aspect of self-compassion and that's self-soothing. So self-soothing really talks about how do we calm our nervous systems how do we attend to our tender hearts that might be burning with anger or crushed by pain or sorrow? And how do we regulate our bodies? So when we're distressed, how do we gain that balance again? How can we use self-compassion to allow ourselves to come back to balance? Because each one of us in so many different ways have been knocked off center, right? We get, and then how do we come back? And really what I want to offer is self-soothing is a core skill in doing that. It's not denial, it's not distraction. It's not like I'm gonna go eat that ice cream or I'm gonna watch six hours of Netflix or I'm going to, it's really how do we help ourselves stay open and connected to that aspect of being human. It's kind of cool, there's a practice in Aikido, it's called returning to center. And what they do is someone stands in the center of the room and, and somebody else comes up and pushes them, and sort of knocks them off balance. And then the practice is come back to center. So that's what I think about with this self-soothing. Self-soothing helps us come back to center. So I just want to say, I don't know about other folks, but um, <laughs> soothing wasn't big in my family of origin. Um, I uh, just not part of what was happening. And so I've really had to work to figure out what does that even mean? And do I even deserve it? And also there's so many things in this culture, the toxic individualism, the patriarchy, the oppressive and domineering nature of our collective psyche really does not support self-soothing. So we're swimming upstream. We can really appreciate that when we think about how do I soothe myself? So we really want to, to appreciate that. So when you start to do these practices or you start to explore this and it's difficult, you can say, oh yeah, of course, this is not the norm. It's not the norm. So I just think it's, it's a beautiful part of the practice. And why I think is because it adds to our resilience. When we can soothe, we can come back online, we can calm the body, we can care for the heart, and it creates resilience. So the second piece, so that's compassion, is wisdom. And I think about wisdom and self-compassion is that wisdom is really that clear seeing. It's to be able to see what is really actually true. And so often what stops us from the practice of self-compassion is the bad habits of the mind that tell us we're not worthy, we aren't capable, we don't deserve, and that is not wisdom. That is not clear seeing. Clear seeing is being able to see, even in the midst of this suffering, and all the kind of crazy things our minds do to try to help us with the suffering, the wisdom is knowing our own true goodness and knowing our interconnectedness and knowing our abilities. So I think about this wisdom as the ability to actually see that. And I think it's actually a, a way of, one way to think about it is the second arrow. People maybe have heard that. There's one thing that happens like, uh, we get hit by an arrow once, like a friend um, disowns us or betrays us, that hurts. But the second arrow is like, 
the narrative that we develop around that. It's like, I deserved it, or I must have done something wrong, or nobody loves me, here it is again. Those are the second arrow. That is the thing that gets in the way of our wisdom. And we all develop these. It's very, very natural. Um, we develop these as a way to try to help this tender heart that gets hurt, gets wounded in so many ways. We all do. And uh, it's funny, many of these we've developed when we were pretty young. <laughs> so I'm just going to say they're not maybe always the wisest. And oftentimes they're really based in fear and self protection so they can be kind of constricted so what we want to do here tonight what I wanted to do is to really explore some ways of self-soothing we'll go through a, a meditation a contemplation but before we do that I want to talk about a particular way to notice when the activities of the mind come up and stop us from that wisdom, from that self-compassion, from that ability to self-soothe. And there's many ways to think about this habit of the mind. It might be defilements, it might be the inner critic, but tonight what I want to use is a particular framework that I've been really liking lately, um, offered by a man named Philip Moffat, which both Jean and I have practiced with, and I, I really respect and admire um, his approach. It's, in my mind, it's very practical. And you can look him up and look at his talks and his articles, but what he talks about is that we all have judging mind, comparing mind, and fixing mind. So he lays it out that these are very common reactions and habits of the mind that we can start to see. And when we start to see them, we can actually go, oh, wait a minute, that's, that's judging mind. I can let that go. I can renounce that. I can step away. I can set that down. And that offers us the opening of the path then to self-compassion, self-soothing, mindfulness. So I'd, I'd like to just quickly name each one of those and then do a practice together. And um, so the first one, judging mind. Um, and, and kind of think about these, you know, we, we all do probably all three, but we can tend to have a favorite <laughs> or in different situations, a different favorite. But judging mind is when you have opinions about yourself, about other people, about the world about what's right, what's wrong, what should happen, what shouldn't happen. And um, it's interesting because sometimes judging mind comes from another voice from your childhood. It could be a critical parent, it could be a religious, it could be a school, it could be... And so sometimes we have these judging minds and they don't even really match our values. So judging mind. Comparing mind is when I say, oh, Jean's so much better than I am. <laughs> Everybody likes Jean better than I, uh, they like me. So we compare ourselves to other people, you know, and we can also compare ourselves against our earlier or later selves. You know, it's like, oh, I used to be really good, now I'm no good. So it's that, that comparing, what's better, what's wrong, you know. And then the third one is fixing mind. And that's the idea that if something's uncomfortable or difficult, you go, hey, I can fix that, or I should fix that, or that's mine to fix. And um, I think oftentimes we do this to ourselves. I always say we have a self-improvement culture, and we're always like, I have to fix myself. I have to make myself better. Or we feel like we have to fix someone else. And this can be very obtrude. Um, invasive and pretty inappropriate and also it's based on the false belief that we think we have more control than we actually do i mean even like if i'm upset and i say oh i should fix that i shouldn't be upset well no 
I, I am upset and there's real reasons for that. So these are the three, judging, comparing, fixing. And so I wondered, Jean, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Or does anybody have anything they'd like to say or a question before we sort of do a first um, reflection and meditation? Just check in with folks. And Jean, certainly if there's something you'd like to offer. Everybody good? And, and these familiar to folks? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. <laughs> All righty, so good. Um, so what we what I'd like to do, um, and then later what I'd like to do is offer a, 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 a meditation on some ways of offering ourselves self-soothing. But what I wanna do is to notice these three ways that we can stop so that when we do the second, you can go, oh, judging mind just came up or comparing mind just came up, or fixing mind. And then we have that tool to watch what can stop us from having compassion or soothing ourselves. Does that make sense? So kind of a two-step. So what I'd like to invite each one of you to do, um, we're just gonna do a short practice where we can kind of sense, feel in our bodies, notice what each one of these conditions actually feel like for us because it's different for each one of us. So I'm just going to invite you to um, settle into a comfortable position. And again, if you'd like to turn off your camera for this practice, certainly do that. Find, find a way of being as comfortable as you can. <sighs> and Kevin, I'm going to uh, invite you to mute. There we go. Great. Thanks. <laughs> I think everyone else is muted. Great. Thanks. So settle in, just let yourself once again come into the body. And perhaps maybe taking a few deep breaths. That's one way to settle, bringing your attention into here and now. Just perhaps setting down other things and say, it's okay. I'm just going to notice here for a bit. And I just invite you to kindly and gently and with care to sort of notice when you consider judging mind, sort of to reflect on when do you notice that in your life? Ever so kindly and gently notice what happens when this mind state steps in for you. Perhaps there's particular situations or relationships where you can feel it even more intensely. Just notice what that judging mind can be like. Perhaps how do you feel it in the body? Perhaps you notice you judge yourself or others more harshly. I'm just curious if you were to set that habit of the mind down, what do you imagine that would look like? Perhaps there's something you would say to yourself or there's an image 
What would it be like to invite yourself to set down the judging mind? And perhaps you might notice there's resistance, very common, very natural. And then I'd like to invite you to experience what comparing mind may feel like for you when it arises. Are there ways that you can compare yourself to others? Maybe better than, worse than, And perhaps notice if there's a way that you feel that in the body. Maybe a tingling or tightness, a familiar feeling. Or maybe there's a story that goes along with comparing mind. Maybe there's certain relationships that really activate this in you, or certain situations. And just kindly and gently let yourself notice. And then I'd like to invite you to consider what would it feel like to set comparing mind down? to move it to the side, to renounce it. Perhaps there's something that you would say to yourself to encourage that. And then lastly, I'd like to invite you to reflect on fixing mind. Where are the times and places and relationships, situations, where there is this urge to fix, to make better, to change? Perhaps you can notice where the roots of this desire come for you. Maybe there's beliefs that are attached to the fixing mind. Now I just invite you to consider what would it be like to set down the desire to fix, to move away from the fixing mind. To let things be as they are without the need to change them. And 
now just for a moment reflect, did you notice that any one of these felt stronger, more common, more typical for you? And what did you notice when you were given the invitation to set them down, to move away from them? So I would, I would love to hear about what folks discovered, noticed. Uh, and again, I mentioned this earlier, we're recording what Jean and I are saying tonight, but a volunteer from Common Ground is very careful that erase anything that anyone says from the recording. So your privacy is, is protected and they're very good at it. So, but I, I'm just curious, um, what arose for folks? What did you notice? What, uh, and also Jean, if there's pieces you'd like to add, offer, I would love to. I'll just add a couple of things. Um, for me, the naming of these states of mind creates enough space so I don't get caught in the story. So if I can name fixing mind or whatever, then I'm less likely to go through the whole narrative about how I am going to fix it <laughs> or what I need to do to fix it. So there's something about the naming of it that's very uh, helpful. The other thing is that um, all of these things are based on our relationship to something else, another being or another object. It's a way we create a fixed sense of self, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a fixed sense of self. We're a different self in every moment, depending on what the conditions are. So it's a... Um, it's, a, it's an interesting exploration to see what, what is the self we are creating through these processes of comparing, judging, fixing. And is that, is that a self that actually persists over time? I think the answer is probably no. Um, but um, And we can carry these fixed sense of self, as you said, from childhood all the way into adulthood, but they don't really apply anymore. You know, so, um, yeah, so I like to tell the story, I'm a twin, so I grew up always comparing, always comparing to the other, mm -hmm. and I still do that, that's just a habit pattern I have, but it doesn't really make, it never made sense then, and it especially doesn't make sense now, so it's a, it's a way, again, we try to grasp on to something, who we are, and it's very, it's a cause of suffering, and it's very limiting and narrows our perspective so that's my two cents <laughs> thank you i i love what you're saying a really important judging says you're this and discernment invites the opportunity to consider your own own your own piece of it and what are just the conditions so thank yeah. you Thank you. Thanks. All righty. Well, I really appreciate what people offered. So I'd like us, now that we've sort of done this thing about, oh, these are the possible things, I'd like to spend some time um, just doing another practice where we can practice with some um, things that can be very helpful for self-soothing. And these come from, again, Philip Moffat's work, some of my own experience, also things from mindful self-compassion. It's just a couple and you can play with them. And I wonder, Jean, 
Do you want to do just a little bit of movement before we do that? We're, we're a little bit behind what I was hoping, but I would love to have some time to sure. move, take care of the body. Yeah, so that's a, a perfect form of soothing, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would just invite you to pay attention now to your body. And we've been sitting here for close to an hour. And so just notice whatever you notice in your body after having sat and meditated and reflected for a while. And see if you can discern if there's something that your body is asking for now in terms of movement or maybe just simply looking away from the screen for a while, or maybe it's standing up, stretching. So, and I notice people are turning off their cameras. That's great. So you don't feel too um, judgmental of yourself. So just take a moment to, again, to discern what your body might be wanting and giving yourself that, whatever it is. And then when you're ever you're ready, you can come back to your seat and take a moment again to notice how the body is now having soothed it a bit. And I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Jean, very much. And before we move to this next piece, I just want to take a moment to reiterate some of the things Jean was saying that I I feel like this um, is so helpful because rather than caught in the narrative, all of a sudden we can we can step back and we can observe that piece of mindfulness where we can step back and go, oh, Look what the mind is doing. And also, as Jean so wisely said, it allows us to like remove the identifying. This isn't me. This is a habit of the mind. And it makes sense the mind likes to do this and wants to do this and feels like it needs to do this. And I notice it's not helpful. So, and sometimes it's just like, I'm going to let that go. No more than that. Just I'm going to let that go. So it's for me, it's been a really kind of uh, interesting and helpful practice. So let's spend some time with um, exploring ways to offer ourselves soothing and comfort. I really appreciate how much is happening in our world right now, and we may be having personal pieces, difficult relationships, things that are hard. And there's also this backdrop of a lot of things that are hard for us. So I want to invite each one of you to just take this time to explore these possibilities about how to offer yourself soothing. And um, there'll be different ones so just kind of see everybody's different one might be one you really like or one's like no that's not such a good fit and we'll just go through those and then have some time to talk and share about those before we end up so again i'd like to invite you to just come into a comfortable position and i think to just invite you to experience these are much better than me just talking about them and again if you'd like to turn off your camera just to find that place of of comfort that's fine allow yourself to settle in in a position that feels good for the body and just taking a moment to just check in with the body
And often, or I'd say always, the first step in self-soothing and also the first component of self-compassion is mindfulness. And I think about mindfulness is the invitation of, can I just be with this? Can I just allow myself to notice that this is what is? Without judgment, without needing to fix. And I just, as we start this practice, I invite you to either notice what is present for you right now, or maybe take some aspect of your life and really use that as the example for this meditation. Maybe it's a relationship or something going on in the world or some aspect of your health or your body. So just allowing yourself to notice This is how it is. And just see if there might be sort of a way you can rest into not striving, not changing, but just, ah, this is. Sometimes if we can just name it, it can help. Not getting caught in the narrative, but just saying, ah, this is present. And part of that is noticing and honoring what your response is. So an important aspect of self-soothing is noticing how is the body responding? Sometimes it's helpful to invite the body to ground, feeling the body sit on the chair, Perhaps imagining ways that the earth supports the body. Oftentimes when we have a strong narrative, inviting our attention to the body can really help. Just noticing what is present and naming, oh, this is sadness, and sadness feels like this. Or this is fear, and fear feels like this. Or anger, confusion. If for someone who has, for a variety of different reasons, not a real good training in noticing the body, this can feel challenging and that's all right. It's just fine. But you're just a very gentle invitation to say, oh, what's present in my body right now? What can I feel here?
And as we feel what the body might be responding to, we can actually offer the body physical soothing. This is something we don't do much. We get touch from other people, but we often don't touch our own body and can be very soothing. We might just put our hand over our heart or both of our hands. Just feeling the warmth the hand, you might even imagine love or care coming through the hand into your body. Or you might rub your body. You might even just rub your arms or give yourself a hug or rub your cheeks, hold your face. Just notice if there's any way that your body responds to being touched, sometimes even holding our own hand. Maybe putting the hands over our belly. Just explore, notice how any type of touch might be soothing. And again, this is not typical. This is something that we maybe is outside of what we've experienced in the past. But I just invite you to explore it. Notice how it feels. And there's also teachings from the Dharma that can really help us. The first one that I think about is the idea of dependent origination. So for many of you, you might not know what that is, or it might seem like some kind of big esoteric idea, but it really just means that there's an understanding that any phenomenon that occurs, occurs because there's many, many other phenomena that goes into that event. And it's incredibly complex and the causes and effects and conditions are very complex and they cover time in the past, in the present, in the future. And for me, that is so helpful that when I become overly responsible or I feel like I should be able to control something or make it be different, when I just realize this, that things occur for many, many reasons, many conditions, far beyond my understanding and far beyond my control. This actually feels like a great relief when we're able to tap into this wisdom. Just notice if you can feel that in your own life, something that you maybe take too much responsibility for, think you need to control or change, and just appreciate how many things go into that that you do not control. Letting go of that desire to personalize,
And the other piece that can be very helpful that's related to this within the teachings of the Dharma is the reality of impermanence. Oftentimes impermanence can maybe add to our anxiety, but it also is a great relief when we realize that this too will change. This too will pass. Oftentimes when I'm upset about a certain situation, I can just say, oh, sweetheart, this will pass. So just notice if you can tap into that wonderful opportunity that impermanence actually offers us. Allowing it to be soothing. And then the last is to invite ourselves to remember both our intentions, a core piece of the Buddhist practice, and also to realize that we do this practice as a way to become more skillful in directing our awareness or our attention. So one way that we can actually soothe ourselves is to remind ourselves of what matters to us. And then allow ourselves to direct our attention towards that. We might have a value of no harming or of approaching difficult situations with kindness or to nurture equanimity. And we can just tap into those aspirations and allow them to offer us the opportunity to shift our awareness We appreciate that each one of these is just a process of practicing, practicing without an attachment to outcome, without expectation, but rather an invitation to live in direct and kind relationship to our experience. This is also the third component of mindful self-compassion, that when we hurt, we choose to respond with kindness. We develop that muscle. So these are all ways that we can nurture this way of bringing ourselves back into balance, of nurturing, of soothing. And maybe it's just even taking a slight edge off. It's oftentimes the most that we can do. But the more that we do it, the better we become at it. It's a skill. And knowing each piece of it we can do, we can follow what feels best for us. Mm. 
And as you hear the sound of the bell, you can turn on your cameras and come back to the group. So I think that was um, <laughs> quite a, as we try to say, a smorgasbord <laughs> or a buffet. <laughs> um, but just in the hope of saying there's so many roads into this and we can just notice what sort of fits for us at any certain time. So I'm curious if there's things that you've found in this particular meditation or ways that you do this for yourself or comments, questions about this whole question of self-soothing is, I think, so important and so lost in our culture. At least for me it was. So I'd love to hear what anyone has to say. And Jean, certainly, if there's pieces you'd like to I loved what you said, Joanna, because I think for me that the truth of dependent origination, the truth of the fact that in every moment there are so many things that are contributing, so many conditions, causes and conditions that are contributing to the present moment is a thing that elicits compassion mm -hmm. and it allows me not to take it on. I mean, what I take on is how I respond in this moment. I'm responsible for that. I'm not I, I, I'm not responsible, I think that's right, for all of the conditions that, that gave rise to this moment. I am responsible for this moment and how I respond, and hopefully I'll respond with compassion towards myself and others. Mm -hmm. So it um, feels like that's a moment of freedom or liberation. For me, I, um, I have brothers that are difficult for me. <laughs> they, have, they have certain beliefs and habits. And it's very helpful for me like to say, oh, they grew up and stayed in a small town in rural Minnesota. That's, those are the causes and conditions. And how would I expect that they would be like me who left and lived in the city and had it and got an education. And, you know, so it's, it's really helpful. I love what you say, Jean, it allows for compassion. It allows for equanimity and it's really helpful to me. It's I, the pairing of wisdom and compassion, the wisdom to know that this is the result of these causes and conditions. And then the response is compassion. Yeah. It's, I just love what you're saying, and I'm sure other people, these, these, I love the term karmic knots, you know, and, and probably this pattern maybe has been intergenerational. Yeah, I'm just like even appreciating that with mine. It's like, oh, I'm still, you know, but then you see these little windows where you're like, oh, I didn't do that old thing. Or even like you watched yourself do the old thing and you went, oh, I'm doing the old thing. But I know I'm doing the whole thing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. So is there anyone else that would like to say anything before we finish up? So I, I would just like, Jean, any, anything? You're good? Okay. Thank you. So I'll just uh, end with uh, sharing of the merit. Um, as many of you know, um, Sharing the Merit is a, a, a very long-standing and beautiful tradition uh, or practice in the Buddhist um, um, <laughs> communities. And it, it comes from this awareness that we're all interrelated. 
and that what is true for me is true for you and that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's interbeing and that I always like to say that we're not practicing self-compassion just for ourselves we're, we're practicing for each other, each one of us that's here tonight on this meeting, supporting each other. And we're also doing this for our friends and family, our larger community, and for people that we don't know. And hopefully for people who suffer, suffer from the injustices and the oppression um, that's systematic in the human condition. So when we do these practices, we're opening our hearts and that is a benefit and merit to everyone. And we do this to remind ourselves. So may the benefit of our practice tonight serve to help to alleviate the suffering of everyone here tonight together and the suffering of those in our community and the broader communities and especially those who suffer from injustice and oppression. And as Jean says, two-legged, four-legged, six-legged, winged, and no-legged beings, all beings, and also our planet, our lovely, beautiful planet. May all beings know happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings be free from sorrow and may all beings live in equanimity and compassion for themselves and for others. So, thank you all for spending your evening with us. And uh, it's lovely to have you here. <laughs>